Some people have said the RGB craze has gone a little bit too far. To them, I would say, you don't know how far too far can go. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. I figured with Zen 2 CPUs being on the market about two months now, it was finally time for me to build myself a scratch system based on the X570 platform. My original plan for this build was to make a much more subdued system, more substance over style, if you will. In fact, none of my original internal components had any RGB lighting on them. That is, of course, until Ingwen sent over their all new 309 chassis for me to take a look at. So what's in the system before we focus too much on the RGB behind me? Well, I went with a Ryzen 7 3700X 8 core 16 threaded CPU with a 3.6 gigahertz base and a 4.4 gigahertz boost. My original plan for this build was to go no holds barred on the memory using a Patriot Viper 4400 megahertz steel series kit. However, there's a reason they're sitting outside of this build. More on that a little bit later. Instead, I opted to go with a 16 gigabyte kit of Guile 3200 megahertz at cast latency 14, although I even had problems getting that to read at the proper speed. For the motherboard on this build, I really wanted to go with X570, as I wanted to take advantage of some of the new PCI Express 4.0 storage options that are on the market, but I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I picked up the cheapest X570 motherboard that I could find in the ASRock X570 Phantom 4 Gaming. It is a full ATX board with four DIMM slots and two M.2 NVMe slots, which should be plenty for my needs. And speaking of storage, we have Patriot Viper's all new VP4100 one terabyte NVMe Gen 4 installed in this rig. It promises on the box up to 5,000 megabyte per second read speeds and 4,400 megabyte per second write speeds. We will certainly be putting that to the test. Powering the uh, Saturday Night Fever that's going on behind me is Fractal Design's all new Ion Plus 760P fully modular platinum rated power supply. And there's one main reason I like this power supply and it's because of the cables you get inside of it. No, I'm not talking about the fact that they're fully modular, although that is certainly a plus. And I'm not talking about the fact that they are braided, which they're not. I'm talking about the selection of cables that you get. Most power supplies in the 750-ish watt range limit the components you can use because there's typically not enough cables to actually plug into everything that you need. Case in point, most power supplies in this range only come with a single 8-pin EPS connector. This one has two. Not only that, but if you're crazy enough to run multiple GPUs in this day and age, most power supplies in this range only include four 8-pin PCIe connectors. This one has six. 
And I know in most gaming rigs these days, you're not gonna be running multiple GPUs, but the fact that it has two EPS connectors on it makes running just about any motherboard pretty trivial for this power supply. And if you're crazy like me and you're looking at running a full virtualization system with three GPUs inside, this might be worth a look. And speaking of GPUs, rounding this build out is the previous generation performance king in the GTX 1080 Ti. Honestly, it was down to either that or the RTX 2080, but my RTX 2080 is white, so that just wouldn't have worked. Cooling wise, if you don't plan on overclocking, I don't think there's any reason to upgrade from the Ryzen 7 3700X's Wraith Prism that it includes in the box. However, I plan on overclocking, so I went with the Scythe Fuma 2. It's not that I think there's anything wrong with the Wraith Prism, it's just when I want to push this thing to the limits, having six heat pipes and dual 120mm fans will certainly be a bonus. So I've shown you DAT RGB, but is that all it can do? Well, actually no. The buttons on the side will control the mode that it's in, plus you can fully customize the front of the display. There are a number of different modes like this chasing one that I really enjoy, plus the RGB fans on the inside actually match what's happening on the front panel. You can also download Inwin's Glow 2 software from their website, which allows you to control the front panel and the RGB fans inside from your desktop. However, you don't seem to get any more customization options than you do from just the buttons on the side. So the looks are pretty amazing if you're into that pixel art display on the front. However, the case itself, I've had a love-hate relationship with for the last couple of years. Now you might ask me why that is, but it's because it's based on the Inwin 303, which is what I built my previous workstation in. And it looks a little something like this. This is my Inwin 303, sporting the Threadripper 1900X and a full custom loop for the CPU. Even though Inwin boasts that full water cooling support is included in this case, I had a litany of problems with that. The problems in this case stem from airflow, especially when you're water cooling a system and you're adding resistance to your airflow. Now, all of the intakes for this case are down on the bottom. That's not normally a problem as they can provide plenty of air coming into your system. The only place to mount a radiator in this case is up on top, which I do have a 360 millimeter installed. However, the problem with this case is that the rad sits only about halfway back. The back half of the case is devoted to the power supply area. As a result of that, you have about this much of the case, which is just dead space with no actual exhaust out the back. There's no fan in the attic space or mechanism to actually get the hot air out of the case. So all that hot air just kind of sits up in the attic with the power supply. The other problem with the mounting of this radiator is the power supply is directly behind the far right fan over here. Now, normally I'd say if you're complaining about hot air from one component blowing onto another, don't worry about it, it doesn't affect anything. However, in this case, it did trigger the overtemp on my EVGA Supernova G3. When my power supply went into overtemp mode, it would ramp the fan up to 100% and would not ramp back down until I physically powered off the system. That meant if I was gaming for more than about 20 minutes at a time, all of a sudden I'm sitting next to what equates to a jet engine. The other problem is right here with the pump and res mount. Now there is an integrated pump and res mount in the Inwin 303 and the 309. However, it's in completely the wrong place. My pump and res is mounted to one of the SSD trays. However, the actual pump and res mount is down here right next to the motherboard tray. Now, the big problem with that is if you have a graphics card that's longer than 11 inches long, which is most of the graphics cards on the market today, you're gonna hit that pump and res. So not only can I not use the integrated pump and res mounts in this case, I had to drill new ones and lose two of my mounting points for two and a half inch SSDs, leaving me with just one inside the system. The solution is pretty simple. Inwin, just swap the position of those two mounts. The two and a half SSDs can go right next to the motherboard tray and then leave plenty of room for water cooling support on the side. I don't know why they didn't do this. All of those problems aside, I do love the aesthetics of this case. I love how clean it is. I love the materials that they used in construction. It is rock solid, sturdy, and just a wonderful case. And it looks great. However, the internal layout could be a little bit better. And I'm a little bit disappointed they didn't change that going to the 309. So if you're looking for a case to do water cooling in, I would look elsewhere besides the 303 or the 309. And that even includes AIOs, as I did have some problems mounting AIOs because of tube length inside of my old 303 when testing for Threadripper. Air cooling is a little bit different story, however. This has been performing admirably with an air cooler on top of it, and I'm really happy to report that, as again, the case does look great. There is only 160 millimeters of clearance, so keep that in mind. You're not gonna be able to use a 140 millimeter air cooler on top of your CPU in here. But on my 3700X at stock speeds, my gaming load was only about 72 degrees Celsius, and even under Prime 95 for 20 minutes, it only hit 90 degrees Celsius, and in fact it leveled off there at about 12 minutes in. So I was very happy with those results. On to the benchmarking, and 
I'm actually not going to be giving benchmark numbers today. In fact, later this week, I'm gonna be benchmarking the 3700X straight up against a 9900K with the same graphics card and same memory to give you an idea of what system you should buy today. The real reason for not including benchmarks in today's video is actually the memory issues that I had on the system. Remember, I had to swap out my Patriot Viper 4400 MHz kit for a Guile 3200 MHz kit. And honestly, I'm not sure why this was a problem. So instead of benchmarking the system yesterday, I spent most of the day figuring out why my memory wasn't running at the speed it should. And remember, AMD recommends 3600 MHz speed for its Ryzen 7 3700X. But this should give me more of an opportunity to do a deeper dive a little bit later on. So stay tuned to the channel if you want to see AMD's entry-level 8-core chip up against Intel's behemoth in the 9900K. I will be doing a full benchmark again with light components in both systems. What I can tell you right off the bat is the 3700X did oust the 9900K in in Cinemage R15 for multi-threaded, scoring a 2178 versus the 9900K's 2024. It did, however, lose ever so slightly in single-threaded performance, 203 to 206. And inside of 3D Mark, I achieved the highest scores I have ever managed with a 1080 Ti. So you're certainly going to want to stay tuned for that benchmark. And that's gonna do it for me in this one, guys. Let me know what you think of this build in general. Do you like the bling outside and the not so bling inside? Or would you rather I went one way or the other? Let me know down in the comments below. Make sure to like this video if you liked it and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans and make sure to check out my Patreon if you're interested in financially backing the channel yourself. And if you're interested in any of the parts that I used in the build today, make sure to follow the Amazon affiliate links down in the video description below. As always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.